morning. Good morning and welcome. Uh, as you probably noticed, I'm not Ryan. He is enjoying some vacation with his uh, family, so uh, it's good, good for them to be able to get away. So uh, welcome this morning. Um, as we celebrate Father's Day, uh, the theme kind of throughout the service will be God is our Father. So welcome to everybody and happy Father's Day. Uh, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 103. Uh, familiar verses for probably a lot of you. So uh, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that, is in, uh, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and, not forget, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Just reading through there, just so many great verses, uh, great kind of nuggets to, to, uh, to pull out of there. It's really encouraging. So as we begin this morning, I ask that you'd stand as we sing our, our opening song. Great is the Lord, and great is his love. Great is his faithfulness and mercy to us. Lifting our voices, we sing to the one whose love lasts forever and whose grace will always overcome. Praise to the Lord, whose love knows no end. God, our Redeemer, healer and friend, hope to the hopeless, loving and good, changing our sorrows into joy, His promises are true. Your love reaches up to the heavens, your grace and your truth are forever. Your justice is strong and your faithfulness endures. Your love reaches up to the heavens. Praise to the Lord, the fountain of life, bringer of blessing, giver of life. Love like no other is ours to receive. God has revealed himself to us, and love is what we see. Your love reaches up to the heavens. Your grace and your truth are forever. Your justice is strong and your faithfulness endures. Your love reaches up to the heavens. God unchanging, love never failing. God unchanging. up to the heavens your grace and your truth are forever your justice is strong and your faithfulness endures your love reaches up to the heavens your love reaches up to the heavens Thy 
my faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever wilt be. Great is Thy faithfulness, great is Thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness screen here and it's good for us to confess our sins together to the Lord. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake Grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There's wonderful promises given in those confessions of sin, that if we confess our sins to the Lord, He forgives us not because of what we've done, not because of what we promise we can try to do better next week or on Monday at work, but because of Jesus Christ. And so that God the Father looks at us and sees us holy and blameless in Jesus, holy and blameless because of Jesus Christ. May that be each of our testimonies and our assurance here today. Our confession of faith this morning comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. And we'll confess these truths together as well. You know what? That is the scripture reading. Do we have 1 John chapter 3?
We do not. Okay. Allie, the other passage you had up, that was good. We'll have that later on. We'll use the Apostles' Creed this morning then. It's a good summary of our faith that unites us with all true believers uh, around the world. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, good morning to each of you. We're happy to have you here, uh, either in person or online, streaming with the service. I wanted to highlight a couple of announcements for this week. Uh, after the service today, we invite you to stick around for coffee and fellowship in the uh, fellowship hall directly behind you. Uh, and then this afternoon at 4 o'clock, youth group and families are invited to attend uh, Good Earth State Park for the outdoor concert. And there's uh, going to be food trucks there, a taco truck. That is at 4 p.m. on uh, this afternoon. Uh, it did not make it into the bulletin, but an email went out with a reminder that ladies' Bible study begins this week. And there's a, a time that meets on Tuesday or on Friday. It's the same exact lesson, same exact book. So it's just whatever works best for your schedule at 9 a.m. here at church on Tuesday morning or Friday morning. Uh, Wednesday night youth group at 6.30. And then next Sunday uh, in the evening, we kick off Vacation Bible School. And so if you have not registered yet for your children or grandchildren, we'd love to have them attend. We'd love to have you invite uh, some uh, of your children's friends and have them come as well. Um, each evening, there'll be a supper served at 5.45. Uh, and then Vacation Bible School will run from 6.30 until 7.45, Sunday night through Wednesday evening. And then looking ahead also, uh, Pickerel Lake High School Camp, our district Bible camp, also begins next Sunday evening. If anyone is going, um, let me know. Maybe we can talk about carpools. And then also uh, junior high camp for uh, those who have finished 5th grade through 8th grade. That will be July 25th through July 30th. So... Those are just some of the announcements that I had. Is there anything else that I overlooked? Baby bottles. If you have your baby bottles, can they put them on the Welcome Center table there, Sharon, for you? Okay. And on the off chance that someone forgot and said, oh, Sharon, I left it at home, what, what can they do with that then? Just bring it next Sunday. Okay. <laughs> there is no penalty. Okay. That's a good gospel encouragement there, Sharon. That's better than part of your giving being deducted for being late or something, I suppose. Yeah, fees and charges. Okay, thank you uh, to those of you who have been a part of that and, and who have been a blessing to the uh, Sioux Falls area right to life. Uh, I hope some of you perhaps saw that email that I sent out this week uh, with a list of schedules, but then too there was a, a wonderful testimony um, that the Alpha Center had to share about a, a gentleman from the uh, who was attending college at USF and was a football player, and his girlfriend got pregnant, and they weren't quite what, sure what to do. And so they went ahead and visited uh, the Alpha Center, and it really changed uh, their family and their life for the better. And so I uh, encourage you to go back and look that up. There's also a hard copy of it on the, uh, well, it's not a bulletin board per se, but as you are going out past the Welcome Center and look to your left, uh, uh, Alex's story, I believe is what it's called, uh, is there as well, and so you can read that. But so we are uh, thankful for the work of the Alpha Center, too, as we think of moms and dads that they minister to as well. Uh, we are grateful to have special music today, and so I'm going to call on Lydia Weiner at this time.
Thank you, Lydia. I invite you to join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. And even as we do that, we think of what a blessing it is to call you our Father, our Heavenly Father. And to know that that means that we then are your children. And so regardless of whether we're 8 years old or 48 years old or, or 98 years old, uh, we belong to you. And you love us and you care for us and you provide for all of our needs. And we even think back to this past week of how you've been with us, of how you've granted safety uh, in travel for those who are traveling and health and restoration and healing of the jobs that you've provided for us, of the homes that you've given us to live in, uh, of the, uh, yes, even uh, fathers and grandfathers that you have blessed us with. And so, God, we, we see your hand of blessing upon us in so many ways. Help us not to take those things for granted. And, Lord, when we think of physical blessings, we're reminded, too, of the spiritual blessings that you give to us that are poured out upon us through Jesus Christ, your love and your mercy and your forgiveness, uh, the salvation you offer to all who believe in you. God, uh, we come before you today and there's uh, different requests and burdens too that, that we bear and that we bring before you. Uh, God, we would uh, ask uh, even now today uh, for your uh, blessing of rain upon us and our communities and we think of areas in, in the Midwest, North Dakota and South Dakota and, and areas East and West, North and South that, that are in need of rain uh, for crops and for farmers and for uh, water, uh, for our, our communities, God, that you would meet those needs there according to your timing. God, we would pray too, especially today, for uh, Heather Rice's cousin, Melanie Fritz, who was severely injured in an accident earlier this week. And so, God, as she is uh, recovering from surgery now and as doctors are waiting to see uh, whether or not they can save her leg, we pray that you would give them uh, incredible wisdom and discernment in that. We pray for Melanie and for her family, that you would be near to them in this time. And so, God, in your mercy and in your goodness, we would ask that, that you would see fit uh, to bring healing and, and strengthening of those arteries and veins and, and circulation and blood flow to return properly. Uh, and yet, God, we commend her into your care and in your hands. And so we not only pray for her physical needs, God, but for her spiritual needs, too, that she would sense you as a close and, and present help in this time of trouble and trial and difficulty. God, we would ask that you'd be with others uh, from our congregation with ongoing health needs. We think of Randy's niece, Michelle, and nephew, Ron, for Natalie Dose, for Glenn Phillips. God, we think of Pastor Jim Lindgren and Pastor Mike McCarlson. Thank you for the continued ways that uh, they see your hand of healing and strength upon them. We think of Dexter Brock and David Otto, and for Tom Griebel and Al Rice and Arden Egan for continued strength and healing for Jim Gard and Scott Wellenstein, for Peyton Weiner and myself. Uh, God, we'd pray for Ruth Olson uh, today as she's uh, moved into assisted living. And so, God, we pray that you would uh, bless that time of transition and change for Ruth and give her grace in those matters. We pray for uh, Dennis Miller as well. And then, too, we think of those who uh, are, are continuing different treatments for cancer as well. And so we pray for Kenny Doden and Roger Horsmeyer, for others that come to our minds today, God, that uh, you would guide their families, their medical team, their caregivers. We think of those who are uh, expecting babies, and so we pray for uh, Igor and Ali Dolas and Reed and Kirsten Joffer, and God, that you'd be with them and their families, and God, that you'd grant good health to both mother and child. We thank you for the gift of life and for the gift of families. And in that vein, too, God, we would ask for uh, your blessing upon uh, our fathers and those who serve as husbands and fathers and grandfathers, that uh, they would continue to love and serve their families in your strength, in your grace, and in your patience. God, we think of those whose hearts ache today, perhaps for those who've uh, lost their earthly fathers, perhaps for those who've lost a child, perhaps for those who, who don't have uh, the relationship that they would desire to have with their own children. God, we had asked that you would comfort there too, as only you can. We think of those who uh, serve in our nation's military, and so we pray for the different members of the Van Meveren family, for Austin and for Garrett and Clayton, for Reed and Kirsten Joffer, for Ashley Doden's brother-in-law, Dan, as he is overseas. And so we pray that you'd be with Ashley's sister and, 
and, and their family in New Mexico to bless them and strengthen them in this time as they're apart from their husband and father, uh, even today on Father's Day. Lord, we think of others who are in dangerous places around the world and ask that you'd bless and protect them, uh, keep them safe. And then, too, we're mindful of the command given in Scripture to, to pray for all people in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, and that includes uh, our, our political leaders. And so, God, today we would pray as we do each Sunday that you would give wisdom and guidance to our president and vice president, to our governor, to our mayor, to our city council members, to other local leaders, uh, to our church council as well. Father, that uh, each of them would lead and guide and govern according to your principles. For those political leaders that we do have that know you and love you, we thank you for that and ask that you can continue to uh, bless those efforts as they seek to serve you and serve their community. God, we also know perhaps there might be some uh, in our nation, even as we look at uh, the just vast number of, of politicians and in the Senate and the House of Representatives and in, in Peer and, and everywhere else, God, who, who don't know you. God, perhaps there's even some who are just openly hostile towards you and, and towards your word and the things that you would have for them. And so we pray for your continued calling upon them, for the softening of their hearts. God, we do desire for all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God, we think of perhaps even others in our, in our own families and extended families who have hardened their hearts or wandered far from you, that you would continue your good and gracious work and your calling in their life as well. We would pray for the different ministries of our AFLC, our church body, and I think of that especially in light of being at, at a conference this past week, the number of others, and as we seek to come together and, and give reports and share updates on our Bible college and seminary in Minneapolis, on, on the work of church startups around the upper Midwest and in San Antonio and on the beach in Hawaii and the oil fields of western North Dakota and in the mountains of Montana. And as we heard reports about mission work in Africa and Brazil and Mexico and uh, work that takes place in remote fishing villages in Alaska, God, we would pray your blessing in all of these. We think of Brent and Emily Ron, too, and the work that they are involved with in Uganda. Be with Emily uh, as she's uh, pregnant and they're looking forward to the blessing of another little one in their family. Continue to grant them good health. And we think of Johnny Sliver and the work of the Merriam Infant Home an orphanage in Brazil. And so God, we pray that your light would shine through to those families, to those little ones who come so hurt and so scarred that yes, their physical needs would be met, but that too they would come to see the love and care and compassion of Jesus, that you'd meet their needs. For other needs that we have today, whether it be financial needs or uh, issues with work and job or uh, relationships, God, whatever they may be, we bring them to you, thankful that you know those needs far better than we do. And so even when we don't know what to do, we turn our eyes and look to you. So Father, grant us patience and trust as we look to you and wait to you. We thank you that these requests are brought not by each one of us or by the pastor, but brought by Jesus Christ, our great high priest and mediator. And so we know with confidence then that you hear these prayers. We pray that you would answer them according to your good and perfect will and plan. In Jesus' name we ask all this now. Amen. This time I'm going to ask that you'll stand for the reading of God's word. I'm going to call on Lisa Joffer to come forward and read our scripture lessons this morning. Good morning. The first lesson for today is found in Psalm chapter 68, verses 1 through 6. May God arise, may his enemies be scattered, may his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke, as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God, but may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him, his name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. 
God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a scorched land. Our second uh, reading for today is found in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did believe, who, all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Here ends the lessons. This month of June and into July, we'll be looking at the theme of images of God. And so last week, we looked at the idea of God as a warrior as he fought for his people, uh, leading them out of Egypt and fighting against Pharaoh's army for them. Uh, and then today, we're going to look at the idea of uh, God as a father. And I'm going to be uh, looking uh, today from the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 11. Hosea is kind of towards the end of the Old Testament. If you have a little trouble in your Bible finding it, it's because it's a smaller book. Uh, 14 chapters. It's right after Lamentations and Ezekiel and Daniel. And if you've hit Joel and Amos and Obadiah, you've got, gone too far. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the prophet Hosea. Hosea has been called the deathbed prophet of Israel. How's that for a title? He was the last prophet to speak God's messages to the people of the northern kingdom of Israel before they fell to the Assyrians, that wicked uh, arm, uh, people and, and just really rough and tough people who lived to the north. And they came in in 722 B.C. and came in and completely <clears throat> wiped out those ten tribes of Israel. Think about that for a minute. Uh, when we read in the Old Testament earlier on, uh, we read of the tribes of, of Jacob, and there was 12 tribes. Ten of them lived in that northern kingdom, and they were wicked people. They really didn't care much for God and his ways. And, and so God warned them time and time again. And finally, Hosea is the one who comes to give them a last chance, if you will. And they did not listen to Hosea either. And so because of that, then Hosea was the one who came and, and brought this desperate message to a people that God loved. Those in the tw ten tribes of Israel in the north, they knew about God, but they had forgotten about him. You know, and I never really put two and two together here, but I was thinking of that when Lisa was doing the, the gospel reading from, the, from John chapter 1. John chapter 1, I, I often think of that. We read that during December in Advent in preparation for Christmas. Uh, there's a, bit, uh, there's a, a beautiful encouragement in there about the light coming into the world and shining in the darkness. Isn't there a bit of sadness in this too, though? He was in the world. The world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. Many 
didn't really care. And I think that that's reflective of the attitudes of the people in Hosea's day. And so Hosea was called to marry Gomer. I'm going to be careful with my words here. But, but Gomer was a woman of ill repute. And why would someone who was holy and, and a person who was supposed to speak for God, why would they do such a thing? Well, because it was to give a graphic picture to the people of Israel of their own unfaithfulness to God. The one they knew, the one they had loved, the one they had made promises to. Oh, yep, you are the one holy and true God of all Israel. We'll love and serve you. And then just like a husband or wife who goes off and forgets those vows they've made in front of friends and family and God and brings shame upon themselves, Isaiah, or I'm sorry, uh, Hosea says to the people of Israel, this is what you are doing. One commentator actually called the book of Hosea uh, of, about a, speaks of a people who have forgotten their God. And so there's some parallel ideas drawn here between the agony of an unfaithful spouse that Hosea would learn about firsthand and then also the tragedy of an unfaithful people. The people of God. People of God who were called to love and serve the one true God. People who were called to let him lead and provide for them. And yet they didn't. And so we read in Hosea chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, we read about God's message and his love for these people. Hosea 11, beginning at verse 1, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. And the more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness and with the bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities and consume the bars of their gates and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. Oh, how can I give up on you, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. And when he roars, his children shall come, trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord. Father, we'd ask that you'd bless this time in your word. There's probably an easier passage to preach from on Father's Day. One that maybe puffs us up a little bit and makes us feel better and gives us a pat on the back and, and sends us off ready to, to be good husbands and fathers and enjoy our time together. And yet this passage, I believe, really gets to the heart of the issue. It speaks of you as your love for us. The ways in which we disobey. We are forgetful. We are stubborn. And yes, we are deserving of punishment at times, God. And yet I thank you that you are loving, you are merciful, you are kind, and that you exemplify and fulfill all the things that we as husbands and fathers can't do on our own. And so we do thank you that you are our Heavenly Father, and that you care for us. Bless this time as we look into your word, God, that you would use the words that I would share today not to be my words, but your words and that uh, you'd speak to each one exactly what they need to hear. Give us humble hearts and listening ears to hear and receive 
and understand and apply these truths today now. We thank you in advance for the work that you'll do in this time and in our lives. Amen. I don't think Hosea would be put in charge of writing cards for Hallmark for Father's Day. And yet, what Hosea says about those relationships between fathers and children and a heavenly father and his spiritual children are true. We're going to look today and, and just kind of touch on a few ideas here in this passage. Uh, but the first truth we're going to look at today is, is what does it mean to have God as my father? And we see that in verse 1. Um, one, there was a number of, of blessings this past week at being at, at annual conference, but one highlight for me, I'll, I'll, I'll lump Jen in there too, she got to sit down on it, but Pastor Bob Lee, uh, who served in our uh, Bible school and seminary for many years, and he was the professor of history. Uh, before Pastor Lee went and worked at headquarters, he was the pastor of my home church in Illinois, so he was my confirmation pastor, so I've known him for many years, but um, he shared an elective session on why does our past shape us for the future? What difference does history make? David, I thought of Lisa. What a great session for anyone who loves history to sit in on. And part of the issue that Pastor Lee shared was there's a number of people who just think, you know, history, that's hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. That doesn't apply to me. Here and now, that's what matters. And he even shared that um, in years past, at the end of the school year, the kids would fill out a comment card about what they liked or what they didn't like or concerns, complaints, whatever. And some of the things would be like this. How does what happened thousands of years ago apply to me today? Or I thought this was a Bible college, not a school of history. Not exactly the ones that you take home and pin up on the refrigerator, right, and, and look at time and time again. Uh, Pastor Lee made an interesting comment. He said, one person has said that if you needed to summarize the entire message of the Old Testament, you could do it in one word. Remember. Remember. And that's exactly what Hosea and the Lord are calling his people to do. Remember. Now, isn't it sad when we forget and perhaps we have family members or loved ones who can't quite remember things like they used to? People who can't remember names and faces or dates or events or even relatives. That's sad. And yet there's also a bit of the arrogance or pride sometimes on our part, even if we do have a good mental memory, perhaps spiritually speaking, we are prone to forget and prone to wander. And so God calls his people, remember. Look at that in verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. There's a bit of nostalgia here. And even if you have your Bibles with you, look back in Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Like the first fruit on a fig tree in its first season, I saw your fathers. And then in chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Israel is, is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. And the more his fruit increased, the more altars he built, the more he improved. That idea or language of God speaking of Israel as grapes in the wilderness that he found, that he cared for. A luxuriant vine that yields fruit. And here he says, when Israel was a child, I loved them. And even later on, he says, I was the one who taught you how to walk and I took you up and carried you in my arms. Is that a picture of how a mom and dad love and care for their kids? There's a bit of nostalgia there and thinking back. And um, I had time on Wednesday. Uh, our kids were in different events and, and Jen was sitting in on uh, the women's uh, sessions on that Wednesday before a conference kicked off on Wednesday night. And so I was in the library reading uh, a number of Bible commentaries on the book of Hosea. And I got to thinking when I was reading about nostalgia and looking back and remembering, I was sitting at the exact table looking out the exact same window that I remember when Jen and I were married and I was the dorm head and she was leaving on a Saturday afternoon to go to a baby shower that some people were hosting. That was 16 years ago. And I was thinking, I'm in the same exact place. That's a little bit of nostalgia. 
And when I go back to campus and I'm with my, my uh, Bible college roommates and seminary classmates and guys who are in ministry or serving in different capacities, either as pastors or as lay people, or I get to see pastors from the Eastern North Dakota district like Pastor Wenzel that I haven't, don't get to see as much as we did before, that, those are fun times. That's nostalgic for me. That makes me think back to the, those good days, wonderful times together. And here God calls his people to stop and think and remember. Remember what God has done for you. Look at the words that are used. I loved them and I called them. I called my son out of Egypt. And think about how the, the Hebrews were brought out of slavery and delivered from the hands of Pharaoh, brought through the Red Sea. And then Hosea had enough uh, time. He knew what happened. He knew, to quote Paul Harvey, he knew the rest of the story. He knew the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and he knew how God planted them in a choice land in Canaan there. He knew how they were cared for every single step of the way. Think about that. God went to great lengths to be with them and to care for them. In 1 John 3, 1, which by the way, about uh, six years ago, that was the first sermon I preached here on a Sunday in June. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. What does it mean to have God as my father? That means that's a wonderful blessing to be called a child of God. I think you can have a number of titles. You can be called um, a husband or a wife. You can be called a doctor or a reverend. Or you can have all sorts of, uh, you know, credentials behind your name. One of the greatest blessings we have is the title that we are given, children of God. When John writes that in 1 John 3, behold means stop and look. Man, this is important. This is really good. So to have God as our Father means then that He is our Father and that we are His children. And that He loves and cares for us. Uh, it's interesting to note too that when we read the uh, account of Mary and Joseph and Jesus fleeing into Egypt for safety away from Herod, as Matthew references that in Matthew chapter 2, 15, he says, and so what was spoken in the Old Testament was fulfilled. And he's referring to this verse here in Hosea 11, 11. I'm sorry, Hosea 11, uh, verse 1. Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod had died, God sent word to Mary and Joseph, and they brought the Christ child back to their homeland out of Egypt. Think of the love and care that God has for you. Think of the way that you love and care for your children and your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews. And then think of the way that God cares for you in an even greater way. We are imperfect, sinful parents and grandparents. And yet God is holy and loving and perfect and faithful in every single way possible. He never forgets. He never loses track. He never knows, doesn't know what's going to happen or forgets something. God is our Father. What a wonderful blessing that is. And then, too, how sad it is then when that offer goes without a response. When John writes and says, he came and appeared to many, and yet many refused him. Many ignored him. Many said, I don't need that. I'm not interested in that. We have a wonderful blessing to have God as our Heavenly Father. So we move on in this passage here. We see what does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean to be a child of God? And how about this, beginning right off the bat in verse 2. The more they were called, the more they listened, the more they followed, the more they loved. No. The more they went away. The more God called them, the more God said, come to me, return to me. That implication, return to me, means you are going one way and God is calling you to do a U-turn and turn the opposite way and come back. Return to me, and yet they kept pressing on. I thought of that a little bit this week. I would not call it rebellion or disobedience. But uh, 
One of the blessings of being at conference and staying in a hotel is a swimming pool that our kids could go to. And there were certain times that Jen was getting things ready in the room, and so yours truly went down to take the kids to the pool and go swimming. And they got to go swimming with their friends, and I got to visit with pastor friends of mine. And then it came time where I would get a text from upstairs saying, okay, Kirk, send the kids upstairs. We need to get out of the pool. And here I am in my boot and in no condition to move, I would call out, hey, guess what? Mom says it's time to get out of the pool. And I would just notice mysteriously, some of the children would start to get a little further and further away from me <laughs> in that swimming pool. Hey, I mean it. We got to get out now. By the time we get showered and cleaned up, we need to go to bed. What? Dad, I didn't hear. I was under the water when you said it that last time. I didn't quite hear it. And, and mysteriously, when they were swimming underwater, they, some, they never swam underwater towards me. It was always further away. Yeah. The more God sent prophets and people to speak his word, the more they hardened their hearts. And they said, who are you to tell me what I should be doing? Who are you to judge me? Why do you think you have it right and I am wrong? Is that a similar mindset and prevailing thought that we have in our culture today? Uh, Jen and I were just visiting with uh, some neighbors who are, who are moving, and we were talking about how hard it is to live as a Christian and to try to be kind and loving and yet somehow claim that you believe that God's word is right and true and free of error when you have people, maybe in your own family and extended family, who, who quite frankly think you're an idiot or a moron for living that way or believing that to be true. They said, you're a pastor. What kind of advice do you give? What, what, what words can I say? And I said, I don't know that I have the right answer. I think you have to pray for those people, that God would soften their hearts. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. But we see that here. What does it mean to be a child of God? God cared for them. He loved them, and yet there was disobedience there. The more they were called, the more they went away. They were disobedient and they were ungrateful. Think of that history of the people as they were brought out of Egypt and as they came to the Red Sea. Do you remember our reading last week from Exodus chapter 14? The people looked at Moses and said, were there not enough graves for us in Egypt that we had to die and be buried out here in front of the Red Sea, Moses? What were you thinking? Why were you leading us this way? And God graciously provided he opened up the Red Sea. The people parted through on dry ground. When Pharaoh and his chariots and his men of army came through, the Red Sea closed. They were taken care of. And you would think the people would say, okay, we learned our lesson. We won't complain anymore. We'll trust you. You know what you're doing. But they didn't. They grumbled and complained for 40 years in the wilderness. They complained about no food. And then when God gave them food, the manna and the quail, they complained they had the same meal all the time. They complained about the bitter water. They were ungrateful. They were disobedient. And why does that matter? Why does history matter? Because history repeats itself. Uh, I think one of the quotes, Mark Twain said, if history doesn't repeat itself, it at least rhymes meaning it comes back in the same way or a similar way, time after time after time. The problems that the people of Israel had in the wilderness are the same problems that you and I have today, and they are our spiritual ancestors. And that means we need to learn from them and pay attention. They were disobedient and ungrateful. Would anyone doubt that? Does anyone want to stand up and say, oh, pastor, I think you're a little hard on them? No. Okay. Okay. Do you know what that means for us? Do you know what that means for you? And do you know what that means for me? That because I have the same DNA and the same problem with sin as those folks did, that I can say real easily, wow, how disobedient and how ungrateful those people were. And yet we have to look at our own lives and say, you know what? Are there times that I'm disobedient? Absolutely. That's why we confess our sins every Sunday. Why we encourage you to confess your sins to God every day on your own. And it means there's times that we're ungrateful because we have those same issues. And so what does a father do with disobedient and ungrateful children? 
We see, first of all, the patience of God in verse 3. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. Ephraim would be a, a poetic name or a descriptive name for God's people. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I had healed them. The emphasis here in verse 3 is I. God is saying, I'm the one who did all these things for you. God showed patience. He loved them and cared for them. Then look at verse 4. There's a change in the description here, and this is why I would say maybe Hosea wouldn't be the one you'd want writing the inside of your Father's Day card. The, 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 the description changes. Before, in verses 2 and 3, they were spoken of as children. You love children. You care for children. You have them in your house. You snuggle up with them in bed at night and cozy up with them. Verse 4, I led them with cords of kindness, with bands of love, and I became to one of them who eases the yoke on their jaws. I bent down to them and fed them. That's the way you talk about animals. That's the way you talk about your donkey and your cattle and your horses. And so all of a sudden, Hosea is changing the description here, changing the, the, the narrative. No longer are these sweet little kids that you just can't wait to cuddle with. Tom, this is like that one cow that just drives you crazy and you're trying to take care of it and it won't do it and it causes you trouble, right? I led them with cords of kindness. I became to the one who took off their yoke, who eased their burden. And I was the one who bent down and cared for them and, and fed them. God is saying, I continue to do all these things for you. And yet in reality, what do I have to show for it? Can you stop and think about times maybe when you took your parents for granted? You know, it was amazing, high school students. Uh, once I moved out of the house and went away to college, how much more I appreciated my parents and all that they did. And I remember my mom saying when I was in college, I can't believe you're sitting here and asking us all these questions and that you actually want our advice on things. And I said, I kind of realized I didn't know as much as maybe I thought I did. The patience of God is amazing. And we're not talking here about patience for people who, who hate God and say, well, I'm not a Christian at all. We're talking about God's patience with his own people, people who would profess to be Christians, people who would profess to be children of God. I'm thankful for God's patience with me as my Heavenly Father. And so that's good to see and note, but then we also have to recognize that God just doesn't say, well, okay, we'll, we'll give it another try here, but that ultimately there comes a time, and only God knows this, but when we go from patience to punishment, look at that in verses 5 through 7, we have a holy God who doesn't tolerate sin. He says, they shall not return to the land of Egypt, well, that's where you went before, for hardships and difficulty, but instead Assyria will be your king. Because they refused to return to me. The sword will rage against them and will consume them. My people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out to me, he shall not raise them up at all. In verses 5 through 7, we see that God brings punishment. God brings discipline. That's why I'm thankful that I'm not God. And that I don't have to decide what's the right time. Uh, for punishment or patience. You know, in, in Lutheran circles, we talk a lot about the law and the gospel. Law means the things that we have to do, God calls us to do, and if we don't do those things, bad things happen. Honor and respect your parents. If you don't do that, bad things are going to happen. You're going to have a hard time in junior high and high school. If you can't show respect to your parents, you're certainly going to have a hard time showing respect to a boss. You're going to have a hard time loving a spouse and caring for them, and so you might as well learn early on to obey and love and respect people. That's law. And then there's the gospel. The gospel says that God loves us and forgives us. And because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross, we are forgiven and can have eternal life. And both of them are true. And you can't just ignore one and think of God as just kind of this kind old grandfather who sits in a rocking chair and looks at you as you uh, live your life and do whatever you want. And God looks at you and just goes, kind of shakes his head and goes, well, huh, what can I do? That's not the way it works. There is punishment. There are consequences for sins. 
And there was consequences for the sins of the people in the Old Testament, and that's why it's good again for us to remember that there are consequences for our sins if we continue to press on in them and go down that path. Which is precisely why Hosea and those prophets of old called time and time again to repent, do a U-turn, come away from that sin and that selfishness and back to the Lord. And so what does it mean then to be a child of God? Well, it means that we have to recognize that probably just as our own kids don't follow our directions all the time, that we do the same with God. And it means that call then to repentance is one for us on a daily basis to confess our sins to the Lord. And say, God, I recognize I can't do this on my own. I need you to live in me and work through me in these situations. And that if we don't, perhaps there are consequences that we face here and now because of that. And so how can we apply, perhaps, some of those lessons the hard way that people of Israel had to learn to our own lives? We have a Father who loves us and who cares for us and who exhibits great patience with us. But don't take lightly, lightly the patience of God. Don't presume upon his kindness. Because God also punishes his children. He disciplines those that he loves. And then lastly, here we end in verses 8 through 11. We see the everlasting love of God, even to those who are disobedient, even to those who, who refuse to listen to him. God still loves them. How can I give up on you? How can I hand you over? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. He says, I won't treat you like Adma or like Zeboim. Uh, we're not familiar with those cities, but those are, are towns from the past that were overthrown along with Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we know what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah. They were punished and completely destroyed. The same was true for Adma and Zeboim. But we recognize here that there is an everlasting and a perfect love of God. You know, when I can say I love my kids, I can say I love my spouse, I love Jen, and yet I can't say that I have a perfect love. Only God can claim that. And yet even in that perfect love, do you hear the, the exasperated tone in verses 8 and 9? How can I give you up? O oh, Ephraim, how can I hand you over, Israel? What do I do with you? One commentator refers to this as a divine vexation. God is so vexed, it's almost if we were going to put a human quality on him in a trait, which is dangerous to do, but kind of just in our thinking, it's at the point when you as a parent say, I am at a loss of what to do next with you kids. You know, if they're three and four and five and don't stay in bed, or if they get older and they're fighting with their siblings, or maybe they're in junior high and high school and they don't listen to you and they're making bad choices... I'm not even sure what to do next with you. I love you so much, but man, I'm frustrated. That's the heart there of our Heavenly Father. And yet he says, I will not punish you. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. Isn't that good in verse 9? God says, I'm not like a, a, an earthly father who might fly off the handle and say something that he later has to go back and apologize for. I'm not going to holler. I'm not going to yell. I'm not going to slam a door. Because I am perfect and I am righteous and I am holy. I'm not a man. I am God. But rather, God addresses Israel here in verses 8 and 9. All of this speaking before was just speaking in general. And now, God is speaking directly to Israel in verses 8 and 9. And one commentator says, this is almost like uh, a picture here of a courtroom scene where God addresses Israel like a defendant on trial. And God is saying, what do I have to do to get through to you? Don't you recognize your guilt? And so we recognize that God has a perfect love, and yet God also has uh, this word from the Hebrew, hesed, is the way we say it in English. Hesed means a steadfast and unchanging and never giving up love that only God can have for his people. And so God says, even though after you've done all these things, I will still love you. I will still care for you. I will still provide for you. And I will call you to return to me. And I will provide for you. 
And though God will bring judgment on his people, he will also bring his people back to himself. Because he loves and cares for them. And that's the wonderful message we have today. That we are blessed by fathers and husbands and grandfathers that God shows his love to us through. And yet they're imperfect people. I'll be the first to admit, I'm an imperfect husband, imperfect father. And I bet you are too, guys. And yet God uses us imperfect people to show his love and care for others. And even that's just a glimpse and a small taste of how much God loves us and cares for us. And how God continually provides for his people, his children. What a blessing we have today to know that we have a heavenly father who invites us to come to him and to consider us his children. Oh, that wonderful Hesed love that never gives up, always pursues, always presses on, never counts what you've done in the past against you, just says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I want you to be with me, and I want to care for you always. That's the love that God has for his people. That's the love that God had for undeserving people in the Old Testament, in the northern kingdom of Israel. That's the undeserving love that God has for us today, for you and me. And so we can rejoice in that love. And we can say about this, man, this is almost too good to be true. I don't deserve this. And yet, God offers that to me. What a blessing to have God call me his child. And what a privilege it is to know that God loves me and cares for me. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your patience and your mercy and your kindness to us. Thank you for your kindness to the people in the Old Testament, and that serves to remind us and call us to, to think through about how we haven't changed over these thousands of years. We still are stubborn and rebellious and prideful and arrogant, and we think we can take care of ourselves. And yet, God, you loved and cared for those people, and you sent them words of warning. God, even today, you love us and care for us, and you send us words of warning. You use the words of the prophet Hosea some 2,700 years later, after they were written, to call us to a right relationship with you, to drop our false pretenses of thinking that we're okay the way that we are and that we can get through life on our own. God, that you call us to return to you. Lord, I would pray today that you'd be working on our hearts and minds, that if we don't know where we're at with that, that you would allow us to visit with someone or pray and ask you simply to be our Heavenly Father, that you would care for us and love us, that we would trust in you and place our confidence and our faith in you and in your word and in your promises. Lord, we would pray your blessing upon husbands and fathers and grandfathers today, just as we pray for our, our mothers and our grandmothers on Mother's Day and our families every Sunday. God, strengthen each of them today for those who are here in person, for those who are watching online. Strengthen them in the tasks that you have laid before them in their vocation and calling to love their wife and to love their children and their families and their extended families the way that you would want us to, to love and serve, to lead in a humble way, in a gentle way, in a patient way, in a way that you do for us. So we ask all this now for your sake and for your glory. Amen. Will you stand as we close this morning? How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all Oh.
Behold the man upon a cross, I sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice called out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was a brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. As we close our time together today, uh, it seems fitting that we should pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. How good it is to know that our Heavenly Father loves to bless his children, loves to give them good gifts. And we are reminded of that every Sunday when we end our service with the benediction, the blessing that God pours out upon his people, upon you and me. Receive now the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.